أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. We are on the threshold of the two months of Muharram and Safar. These two months are times of mourning, the tragedies. the most heinous and indescribable tragedies in all history, which took place on the day of Ashura. I would like to take this opportunity to send my condolences for this painful tragedy that we read about in Zirat Ashura and elsewhere. I offer my condolences to the holy awaited Savior Imam al-Mahdi, may God hasten his reappearance and may God's peace and blessings be upon him. And I hope that God Almighty would honor us by speeding up the advent of this holy Imam. I hope Imam Mahdi prays to God for the hastening of his own reappearance so that all humanity be rescued from the oppression and injustice they face in all corners of this planet. such as the economic injustice, political suppression, and social discrimination. I hope for an end to all injustice. I also send my condolences to all people around the world. Because this tragedy is mourned both on the earth and in the heavens. In Kamal al Ziyarat, we read that the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, mentions Imam Hussein. And His Holiness invoked some curses. As for the first curse, the Prophet asked of God Almighty, O God, let down whoever lets down Hussein. This is rather a short sentence. The Prophet asked of God by his boundless knowledge and power to abandon whoever abandons Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Hold 
Abandoning someone is not the same as opposing someone. You can find the definition in dictionaries. It is the same as refusing to support someone. And it is different from inflicting harm or being inimical towards someone. Yet, abandoning someone is not supporting them. This curse is invoked on anyone, no matter what period they live in. O oh God, let down whoever that lets down Hussein. In other words, it says, O oh God, abandon anyone who abandons Hussein. And so, God abandons them when they have financial issues or when they have to deal with injustice or when they have political or even family issues. This is what the Holy Prophet asks of God. Maybe that is the reason why many prayers are not granted even if these people do their religious duties. Sayyid bin Tawus and Alama Majlisi, they both have listed 16 reasons why prayers are not granted based on the traditions that we have. Of course, the dear scholars can also research this topic. And even add to the list. Scholars in the past did what they could and they listed 16 reasons. This curse by the Prophet can be another reason for the unanswered prayers, even though God has said, Call me and I will answer you. People subjected by this curse will be abandoned and let down by God. And this is what happens in this world, let alone the hereafter. It is better for people who refuse to support Imam Hussein to see their own punishment in this world because it ends at some point. But if it is postponed to the hereafter, it will be unbearable. Refusing to support, like you can build a Husseiniya, but you don't. You can host a commemorative ceremony, but you don't. You can assist people holding a commemorative ceremony, but you don't. 
It's all about refusing to support, not standing in opposition. I will mention three books, but you can find the same idea in dozens of other books. And it is about the life of the great scholars. These books are Ayyan al-Shia, Alam al-Shia, and Khatim al-Mustadrak. You study them by yourselves. And it's so easy these days to study these books. I only mention one example. There were some outbreaks of cholera in the city of Karbala. The city of Najaf also faced cholera at times. Many great scholars died in these outbreaks. There was cholera in Karbala during the life of the author of Jawahar, in which Sharif al ulima and his wife and his two children died because of the disease. Another scholar named Ghazwini also died in the same year. Many people died in those times. The author of Jawahir has said in his book, Cholera hit Karbala 20 years before the death of the Jawahir's author. And in the book Jawahir, we read about the cholera in the city of Najaf, and many, many people died because of it. I once said that my late father, when he was a teenager, he witnessed the cholera outbreak in the holy city of Karbala. And this story dates back before 1920, before World War I. At then, the entire Iraq was hit with the cholera. Many scholars died because of this. My late father used to say that when he was a teenager, he was a member of a family of 10 people. And when cholera hit the city of Karbala, even the people who performed the burial services died of this disease. My father used to say that at some point when people died of this disease, their bodies were left in the suburbs of the city near the river. People stopped performing bureau services for their deceased. They just left the dead bodies in there, 300 to 400 dead bodies. And later on, these dead bodies caused more diseases and naturally more casualties. In the alleyway that my father used to live in, it was a dead-end alleyway with dozens of houses in there. All people in those houses lost some family members to the cholera.
But to everyone's surprise, my late father's family did not lose anyone. My father then explained that they used to have Rosa in their house every day. If you stick with Imam Hussein, you will enjoy both in this world and the next. O oh God, let them down, one who lets down Hussein. Some people can offer intellectual or financial support to the cause of Imam Hussein. Today, there are many Husseiniyas around the world. Yet, there are many more houses of corruption. Could we increase the number of Husseiniyas from the last year? Is it not a case of letting Imam Hussein down? Were there not enough capable people to build Husseiniyas among believers? There have always been misgivings, even during the time of the life of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. During the short occultation era, these misgivings increased so much. Some even claimed that Imam Hussein was not killed. My late brother, Sayyid Hassan, mentioned the name of a Sunni scholar in Syria who wrote a book and claimed that Imam Hussein was not murdered. The tragedy of Imam Hussein is so unknown in the world. Who has the responsibility to make it public? Everyone has a share of this responsibility. And if anyone refuses to do their share, it's like letting down Imam Hussein. You can visit Imam Hussein's shrine, but you don't. Of course, you are excused if you are incapable. Or the officials who work in Iraq and in other places, they can help the pilgrims, but they don't. They don't help pilgrims with visa and stuff, let alone putting barriers in their way. I have said it multiple times, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, is an exception in all history. Imam Hussein is an exception even among the holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. We can never see the same grief in the martyrdom of the Prophet of Islam or Imam Ali or Imam Hassan al mushtaba The Prophet's emphasis of pilgrimage to Imam Hussein's shrine is unmatched. Imam Hussein is an exception in all history, particularly among the Shia. Two groups have a bigger responsibility because of their power. One of them are scholars and the other one are the youths. Many people know this tradition by heart. Many 
Clever is he who is better off today than yesterday. Is it about eating a more delicious food? Of course not. It's not what the Holy Allah, be peace be upon them, are trying to say. Imam Ali has said that the sweetness of this world is the bitterness of the afterlife. So it's all about recognizing and doing our responsibilities. Clever is he who is better off today than yesterday. Poor is he who is the same as yesterday. And wretched is he who is worse than what he was yesterday. Last year you hosted the Husseini rituals, but you didn't do it this year. This person is truly wretched. Last year you visited Imam Hussein shrine despite, despite all the hurdles, but this year you do not do it even though you could. That's the case of being worse off than yesterday. You need to contemplate on these issues. You can enjoy this life and the next through Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. You only need to besiege Imam Hussein for help. Last year you visited Karbala and this year you pay for others to join you too. There are people who pay for others, buy airplane tickets and have other people join this event. These days, boarding a ship is very safe, but it wasn't so in the past. My great-grandmother went on, a, on the Hajj pilgrimage with the ship and she used to say that this ship was filled with passengers on all levels. Some passengers, including my grandmother, were taken in the ship's dock. Usually, all the goods and products are kept in the dock. But at then, the passengers were kept in the dock. This trip lasted for one whole year. My grandmother used to say that they did not have enough space even to sit. But later on, they were given enough space in the ship. And later it became clear that the passengers in that part of the ship had become sick and died. Usually when people die on a ship,
Some weights are tied to the legs of the dead bodies and they are thrown into the water. There is a tradition in Kamala Ziyarat. Someone said that he was fearful of boarding a ship for visiting Imam Hussein's shrine. This person feared of sinking in the sea by the big currents. These days, cruises on the sea are less dangerous. In response to this person, the Imam smiled and said, If you die in this way, you will be led to paradise. Maybe such a person is taken to paradise, no questions asked. There is also a tradition that all people have to answer to Imam Hussein on the Judgment Day. So beware of not letting Imam Hussein down. I might have said it before, but that's okay. Whatever we say about Imam Hussein, it's not enough. There were some people who wanted to build a Husseiniya. They were raising funds to build this Husseiniya. These people met with me and one of them, who was their leader and the elder one, told me, that they could not raise enough money to build the Husseiniya. They were somehow supporting the cause of Imam Hussein. This person was so upset, and so he told Imam Hussein that. He told Imam Hussein that he cannot serve Imam Hussein anymore. Because he felt being insulted when he was raising money. This person was a friend. So I told him, Did anybody refuse to meet you? He answered, No. Then I asked him, Did anybody spit at you? He answered, no. Then I told him that the best of the entire creation, the Holy Prophet of Islam, when he was preaching Islam in Mecca, He tolerated all kinds of hardships. 
I highly recommend the youths to read about the Prophet's life. Ten volumes of the book Bihar al-Anwar are about the Prophet's life. Starting from volume 15 to almost volume 25. The Prophet used to preach Islam, but policies did not let him in their gatherings. The Prophet was the best of the entire creation. He was the reason for the creation of the entire universe. But polytheists spit at the Prophet's holy face. And the Prophet never gave up. He never felt being insulted so as to stop preaching. And that's why the Prophet is a great role model for us. Good for anyone who is insulted for the sake of Imam Hussein. Traditions count great rewards for people who are present or even killed in the way of visiting Imam Hussein's shrine. And finally, those people who oppress these pilgrims will be taken to hell from where they can see. These joyful pilgrims in the paradise. So it's well worth it for pilgrims to go through hardships in this world in the country of Iran around 100 years ago. Many people were fined and detained for hosting the rituals of Imam Hussein. In the middle of the nights, in the basement of houses, people came together in secret for these rituals. Someone told me that if the authorities could locate these gatherings, they would have fined all the people who took part in these rituals. Besides, they were also detained and tortured. But what happened to those oppressors? What happened to Banu Marwan, the Abbasid, and others? So beware of not supporting Imam Hussein on any level. Someone asks for money to hold the Hussein rituals. If we can help them and don't do it, it is the same as letting Imam Hussein down. You can see these lines in Kamala Ziyarat. Oh God, let down those who let down Imam Hussein. So let's try to remain positive and supportive. 
اگه نمیتونیم نرو ما نگیم بگو که دیگه بگو I also would like to talk about the sacred rituals of Imam Hussein. There are some people who are misinformed. God help them. If these people had studied Rasail by Sheikh Ansari, they would never have said these things. I heard it myself that one of these people claimed because these rituals were not existent in the time of the Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them, we should stop having them. Many scholars lived during the cholera times in the city of Karbala. I have searched for many years, but I could not find any truly great scholar who discourages people from Imam Hussein's pilgrimage because of the cholera. This has no precedent in our history. All these scholars permitted people to visit Karbala despite the cholera. And, a and as a result, some people might have died in the way. But it was a time when Akhun Khorasani, Kazim Yazdi, Ismail Sadr, Mirza Shirazi, and many other great scholars were present. But none of them ever discouraged people from going to the pilgrimage. In the book of Orwatul Watqa, we read that one should not go to Hajj if there are dangers in the way. And if someone ignores the dangers, their Hajj is not accepted. And yet, Hajj is an obligatory act. But never the same was said about the pilgrimage to Imam Hussein. Some scholars are even of the opinion that no threat should stop Imam Hussein's pilgrimage. Allama Amini states, many scholars have the same opinion. The two months of Muharram and Safar are good times for preaching Islam. The Prophet had prophesied that a time will come when only the name of Islam remains. We have the name of Islam in Muslim countries, but the Islam introduced by the Prophet, the Holy Quran, and the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, is absent. Islam is made up of a set of beliefs which are founded on five pillars, God's oneness, justice, prophethood, emanate, and resurrection. And then it's the laws of Islam, 
which are explained in 48 books. And also the ethics of Islam. The three shape up the real Islam. And I am sorry to admit that none of it can be seen in Muslim countries. For learning about the Islamic beliefs, you can read Bihar, volumes 3 to 53. And each volume contains more than 1,000 traditions. So 52 volumes of Bihar al-Anwar are about Islamic beliefs, but not much of them are implemented in Muslim countries. You can easily access the book Bihar al-Anwar. The first two volumes of Bihar discuss the issue of knowledge and ignorance. Volume 3 discusses oneness of God. And it keeps talking about Islamic beliefs up until volume 53. All these traditions constitute the Islamic beliefs. You can find the traditions about Islamic law in Rasa'el. There are as many as 60,000 traditions about Islamic law. And they constitute the Islamic law. But not much of it is implemented in Muslim countries. You can also see traditions about the Islamic ethics in Bihar and elsewhere. Who is responsible to make these traditions public? There is no better time than today. We never had such a great opportunity in the past. We have access to newspapers, journals, books, TV networks, radios, and what have you. Ten people together can launch a radio station to publish Bihar. My father used to say that all books written by Majlisi were considered illegal in the Ottoman Empire. People went to prison for just having these books. There are many TV networks that publish false traditions from the Prophet. I myself have watched some of these TV channels. It is our responsibility to counter it. No doubt that scholars have a bigger responsibility. Scholars and rulers have the biggest role in this regard. There is a tradition from Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him. It's a lengthy tradition. The Holy Imam said, the scholars of the Shia Muslims are border guards that push back Satan and his dominions and its minions. In another tradition, Imam was asked about the number of angels. We can find this tradition in Kafi. 
The Imam responded, their number is that of the grains of sand. A handful of sand has countless grains in it. In another tradition, someone asked about the number of demons. Scholars have different views on this question. Generally, all demons are grouped into three. Satan himself, the one who disobeyed God in the first place, but he also has some minions, one of whom is the Ifrit. The Ifrit are the strong devils. And in a lower level, we have the demons. It is said that each and every person has several demons assigned to them. Two demons on one's lips, twenty-five other demons in one's heart, and so on. There are also angels assigned to people. I have seen this tradition in Bihar, and I have mentioned this many times, that on the day of Ashura, in those final moments when Imam Hussein was martyred, Satan, the chief of all devils and demons, yelled, From now on, we must spread misgivings. And that's why we see so many misgivings in the Husseini rituals. Who should make these realities public? This is a collective responsibility. This is not a conditional duty like the Hajj, in which you are excused if you do not have the conditions. It's a collective duty. It's mentioned in many verses of the Qur'an and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. The rituals of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, are sacred. This idea is underscored in the Qur'an and traditions of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And since the word rituals are not defined by the Qur'an or the traditions, we need to refer to the public opinion. The Qur'an reads, Whoever reveres these signs and rituals of God, it is a sign of a pure heart. But what are these signs? The Qur'an mentions only two examples. But that is not all of it. Generally, anything that is considered a veneration of God is considered to be a sign of God. 
Some people object that a specific ritual was not existent in the time of the Ahlul Bayt. These people should study Rasail more closely. There were no cars, trains, cell phones, TVs, or planes in the time of the Holy Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. The Ahlul Bayt and the Quran talked about general issues. And it is our job to apply these general laws to specific issues. The Zari of Imam Hussein is a veneration of this holy Imam. It should be noted that traditions also mention Zari, but literally speaking, this word referred to the grave. But nowadays, the Zari is the structure that is installed above the grave site. All these mourning rituals, the black clothes, and etc. They all were non-existent in the past, but they are still sacred rituals. Unfortunately, some objections are there only to deceive the public. Anyone who has studied Luma and the Rasail would never say such things. That is the logic of people who are not the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. It is only a personal opinion. That has nothing to do with the Quran or the Ahlul Bayt. By this time next year, is it impossible to increase the number of the Husseiniyas in the world? 20 years ago, I read an article about a mosque in Turkey. It's quite a big mosque. And the name of the mosque is very peculiar. There was this poor person in Turkey who wanted to build a mosque. This person started making small savings, buying cheap food and buying cheap clothes. And he finally built a mosque by these small savings. As you can see, it is really possible. Don't you like to leave this world after doing such a thing? Take loans if necessary. It's okay if you could not pay it off easily. The Holy Prophet is a great role model for all of us. There are many traditions showing that the Prophet used to take loans. All people take loans to support their families, even when it is not necessary. So what's the problem with taking loans to support Imam Hussein's cause? It's okay if you had problems paying off the debt. Traditions say that after the Holy Prophet was martyred, for as long as seven years, I have seen it in multiple traditions, that for seven years, Imam Ali went to Hajj and made public announcements 
asking people to come to him if the Prophet owed them some money. Why did the Prophet take loans? The Prophet had a very simple lifestyle. According to traditions, when Imam Ali, peace be upon him, was martyred, he had a debt of 700,000 coins. It is either gold coins or silver coins. If it is silver coins, then it equals 70,000 sheep. And if it was gold coins, it equals 700,000 sheep. Traditions say that when Imam Hassan, peace be upon him, came back from the funeral of his father, Imam Ali, he delivered a sermon to the public in which he said, I just buried someone who had left no money as inheritance. All those needs, all those debts were taken to address the public needs of the Muslims. So it's a great virtue to take loans for Imam Hussein. It's just like taking loans for your own affairs, even better. Let's try to continue and expand the sacred rituals of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, and even increase them in number. Of course, on the condition that these rituals are not haram or forbidden acts. So it is never wrong to have majalis in preparation for Muharram. A few days back, someone asked the government for permission to have some special lighting in his majlis. And this person was scolded for wasting electricity for such things. I hope this official repents from what he said. This is not letting down Imam Hussein. It is as bad as opposing the Imam. Letting down Imam Hussein is refusing to support the rituals of Imam Hussein. I should translate this tradition to some of the audience. The scholars are border guards. We find the same wording and idea in the Holy Quran in Surah Al Imran. There used to be border guards between Muslim and non-Muslim territories. These guards changed posts every one or two months. And their job was to notify the capital in case neighbors intended to attack the Muslim country. There is also a special chapter in the books of the Islamic law about these border guards. In the past, the bandits used to ambush caravans in narrow passages. 
so as to hide and hold the upper hand by a surprise attack. Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, said, The scholars are border guards that push back Satan and his minions. Therefore, the scholars have a big responsibility. The youths, since they have time and energy, they also have a big responsibility. And lastly, it's about Arbain pilgrimage. The Arbain pilgrimage is unique in our world today. Well done to the proud nation of Iraq, especially the poor people. Some people sold out their house and used the money to serve pilgrims in Arbain. Some of them used their savings to serve pilgrims in the Arbain. No real scholar has decreed it to be haram or forbidden. Over the last 1,000 years, there have been many outbreaks of cholera and plague in the city of Karbala. The Abbas had used to mirror the pilgrims of Imam Hussein. But never once the Imams discouraged people from making this pilgrimage. I hope these ignorant naysayers repent in this world. Make up your minds now to encourage everyone and to contribute to the Arbain pilgrimage. Let's make sure this year's Arbain is not smaller than the previous years. May God's peace and blessings be upon Muhammad and his pure household.